Hello, and welcome to the Artificial Podcast, with your host Nick Myers. Artificial Intelligence. Voice Recognition. Machine Learning. Robotic. Actionable Analytics. It is Nick's goal to help everyone understand how AI and voice technology are reshaping our lives both personally and within organizations. Your glimpse into the growing world of AI and voice first starts now. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Welcome to the Artificial Podcast. My name is Nick Myers, and I am here to help break down topics in emerging technology, artificial intelligence, and voice to help everyone understand how these technologies are impacting our lives both personally and within our organizations. The Artificial Podcast is brought to you by Red Fox AI. Red Fox AI helps give brands a voice by leveraging the power of AI and voice assistant technologies like Alexa and Google Assistant. If you or your organization is interested in sponsoring an episode, please send an email to the artificial podcast at redfox-ai.com. If you like what you hear, please feel free to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. You can also follow the artificial podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube by searching for the artificial podcast. Thank you for listening, and now on to this week's episode. Hey there, Artificial Podcasters. Welcome to another week and another episode of the Artificial Podcast. My name is Nick Myers, and this week I am excited to welcome Micah Gronawega to the Artificial Podcast. And I had the pleasure of meeting Micah for the first time during Voice Lunch. It was actually one of the first Voice Lunch events that were hosted that are put on um, by Carol Stritcha and Mikhail Stanislawik. Um, if you're in the voice space, then I would assume or, or hope at this point you may have seen some of these events or be familiar with them. But even if you're not a voice practitioner, they're still really cool to check out to learn about this technology. But anyways, Mike and I had the pleasure of, of meeting in one of the voice lunches, and I just loved everything that she had to say about conversational design and voice and then we had a follow-up conversation and it, it was just awesome so I somehow convinced her to do a podcast episode with me so I'm really grateful that she's here but a bit about Micah here Micah is passionate about conversation design it is a profession that is right in the sweet spot of her interests writing analysis psychology user support component management and above all her big love linguistics she discovered conversation design at the start of 2019 and decided to start ConvoCat Conversational Expertise at the start of 2020. Micah loves the hands-on work of building and designing chatbots and increasingly voice assistants. Next to that, she coaches content teams that are just starting the big adventure of building their own enterprise chatbots. Prior to founding ConvoCat, Micah spent 20 years working as a technical writer, international project manager, and agile information analyst for companies like Lucent Technologies, Dutch Air Traffic Control, Dutch Bank AMRO, and Dutch Railways. Micah, welcome to the Artificial Podcast. How are you? Thank you so much, Nick. I'm really fine and very excited to be here. Actually, it didn't take a lot of convincing to, to be on your podcast. I, I love being here. <laughs> well, I knew from the, the first time, within the first 10, 15 minutes of our follow-up chat, I knew like you and I would see eye to eye on so many things. And we ended up, that ended up being the case because you're just so knowledgeable when it comes to the linguistic side of looking at voice from, you know, from that realm based on your prior work. And then of course, we just talked about AI. We talked about things happening in the US. We talked about like so many different things and I just loved every minute of it. Thanks. Yeah, it's um, it's it's just so lovely. I I don't know about you, but ever since I joined the voice community, I do find that there's so many like-minded people that actually have a bit of a chatbot mind them themselves. Like mm -hmm. it's so easy to hop from linguistics to Asimov and robotics to AI and back again to history. So yeah, it's just a really great space to be in at the moment. It's uh, yeah. a very exciting time for people like me. Yeah, I, I would agree completely. And I was actually, you know, I, I didn't even know there was a whole voice community when I first started working in this space back in late 2017, early 2018. It was only a couple months in that I actually found that there was other people. Um, and I was shocked at how welcoming and like-minded others were. So I completely agree with you there. 
But to kick off our conversation here, you know, what led you to become a linguist and how did that work influence your journey to now working in conversation design and on chatbots and, you know, voice? Oh, it's um, um, linguistics. I, I guess it was just something that, that happened to me. I, as a child, I always loved reading and writing and also kind of finding out about stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was always writing these little almost like software manuals or manuals on all kinds of topics. And because I wasn't really good at science or maths, I thought, well, why don't I just follow my heart and study English? So I went to uni and actually a big part of studying English in my university consisted of linguistics, which is like basically all kinds of aspects of language, like yeah. syntax, grammar, but especially sound and sound structure, how sound structure works in language. And um, it's just so fascinating. As a child, I already kind of wondered about why do Dutch people say wereld and German people say welt and English yeah. people say world. Uh, it, it all looks the same on paper, but we all find different <laughs> yeah. strategies for pronouncing. And that's that that fascination that kind of led to me studying linguistics because that would that's what linguists do they study this yeah. kind of phenomenon and um after graduation it was actually not a very good time for linguists to to break into the field it was uh, early 2000s i think mm -hmm. so just in the time of the big internet bubble burst um, so instead, I just um, kind of left linguistics and, and turned a technical writer, which is equally exciting. But for about 20 years, I didn't really speak to other linguists until 2019, when I discovered about chatbots, voice mm -hmm. assistants, and all of a sudden, there they were, all my fellow linguists. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So it's... Um, it's actually quite surprising how much of the things I learned back then are still so very relevant to our field. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy to be back again. Feels like coming home a bit. No, that that's incredible to hear. And I, you're absolutely right. You know, I, I, I think I can honestly say when I first started really getting to work with or starting to work with rather Alexa and Google assistant and some of the different voice assistants we have now, I, I, of course, am not any type of conversation designer or linguist or anything by trade, and I had no idea how much of that actually went into designing a quality experience on these platforms and even some chatbot work that I even got into. I, I had no idea. So um, I, I can see why your history and past working as a linguist has probably only accelerated your success so far in this space because you understand how language works. And, you know, it's... It's one thing talking to another human being, completely different trying to talk to a computer. I mean, it's, it's just night and day, I'm sure, as you've, as you've learned getting more into this yourself over the last couple of years. Yes, most definitely. And I think um, that it's especially exciting right now that people like, like Kathy Pearl, obviously, but also Bob Moore from IBM are kind of showing us the way into how human conversation works because there's already such a, a huge amount of knowledge on that the mm -hmm. conversational analysts have been studying this field for well since the the tape recorder was invented and people found hey we can actually record conversations yeah. and analyze them and when they started doing that they discovered that there's all kinds of underlying patterns in human conversation we don't just talk at random we talk very freely but we mm -hmm. can only do so because we use fixed patterns in our conversation and many of these patterns not all of them but many um, are very useful for designing voice experiences for human machine interaction as well and i i think that we're only just starting to scratch the surface of that mm -hmm. and that this kind of knowledge um, can be spread even more widely across the design and development community. So it's a very exciting time for linguists indeed. Absolutely. And I, I, would, I would place a large bet on that there may be an influx of people deciding to go down that path of being a linguist as this technology becomes more ubiquitous and more prevalent, especially you know, say you're an enterprise level company and you're looking to maybe develop your own voice assistant versus using a third party one. Well, 
and to do that, you need to understand language. So what do you do? You hire a linguist. <laughs> <laughs> so. A linguist or a psychologist, actually, because it's, of course, it's, it's a multidisciplinary kind of field. Yeah. But yeah, definitely someone with a lot of knowledge of the human mind. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's super fascinating. So as a linguist, what have been some of the most fascinating projects that you've been able to work on to date, like either in the past or something recently? <laughs> well, the, the, my very first project back in university was actually studying um, the use of you know by English speakers. Like you, when you talk to each other, you know, you're looking. Oh my God, that's fascinating. <laughs> and um, um, I, I can't remember the exact findings of my paper anymore, but it's actually a really serious topic because people have been writing books on the usage of you know. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> It's just really interesting that the knowledge of that kind of interjections, discourse markers, uh, turn signalers um, is so useful to us now. I guess more recent, um, to be honest, I don't have a lot of um, project experience in voice yet yeah. because voice in the Netherlands compared to the States or the UK is, is still very, very young, very yeah. much in its infancy. But I did release my own um, SSML course for Dutch and nice. where I kind of SSML my way around Dutch pronunciation problems on Google Assistant. And the things you actually have to do to get my own name pronounced properly, Maike Groenewege. I can only uh, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I can only that imagine. Was a, that was a study in itself. And yeah. um, that learned me so much about the more like the phonetic um, properties of and uh, of, of Google Assistant, how the voice works and how you can work your way around. Um, and that also got me really interested in more like the, what we call the paralinguistic side of voice. So not just the words that you say, but also the intonation that you use to say them. It's like the sentence melody, when you mm -hmm. speak in a neutral voice, it's kind of, you know, blah, 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 blah. but when you're more like excited, then the tone right. rises. And this would be so wonderful if we could have like more um, control over this kind of features. You know, it would be lovely to just turn a knob and yes. um, have your voice kind of being being adjusted like that. So yeah. I'm kind of deep diving into that with some speech technologist, which I never thought I'd be doing, but <laughs> it. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that's more the phonetic side of stuff. And as I said, from a more conversation analysis point of view, um, Bob Moore has been highly influential on my current work because he um, he's um, offering this kind of framework for us to talk about language in a, a unified, general way, like we all can talk about the same kind of models. Mm -hmm. And he actually proposes the expandable sequence as a unit for conversation or as a kind of a, um, yeah, a reusable component model. And that's something that interests me really a lot. And I'm currently trying to, to apply it to some real life cases mm -hmm. and actually model it in, in Google Assistant because Very we cool. don't have Alexa over here. <laughs> Yeah, very cool. And I, I love the, the the first example, of course, you brought up the, the you know study. Like, I actually did not realize until I, actually, until I started recording this podcast back in May of last year, I would notice when I would record, you know, the first few episodes, and then I'd start listening back to them. I said, you know, a lot. And I think I still do without even realizing it. But it's like such a common filler phrase. <laughs> It's like, true. You know and like. And I've been counting. Counting. I think you said like already four times in half a minute. Yeah, that's the linguist in you. I have. I've seen. I haven't even. I'm cog. I haven't even consciously realized I've been saying like. And and one thing I, I don't know if you know anything on this, but um, too. I when I first started speaking, one of my big, um, my big weaknesses that I had was saying um, and I worked very, very diligently to try and overcome that. But now that I personally have gotten better at that, I notice when I lit, sit and listen to other people talk on stage, um, I always pick out when they say, um, is there any studies or anything you know behind um? Is that another filler word or? Um is definitely a filler word. I don't know a lot about it, I'm afraid, but it's it's basically the cement. Uh, people hardly ever talk in full sentences unless they're kind of 
almost forced to, like in mm -hmm. artificial situations. But if you look at transcripts from ordinary speech, there's hardly a full sentence or a finished sentence in there because we kind of make up our messages as we go. Yeah. So um, it's just it's just ubiqu uh, ubiquitous. I think is the word. Yep. It's everywhere. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it's and... normal. There's nothing to be worried about if you um a lot. It's probably an indicator that you probably think a lot as well. Interesting. You know, one one other thing that's always fascinated me too is dialects, and how you can have a language, but there can be so many different variations of that. I mean, isn't, um, forgive me, I, I, I read this statistic somewhere, isn't there, you know, when you look at um, Hindi or um, a language in India, isn't there like hundreds of dialects for that language? More, even more. Oh my I think gosh. That official languages run into the hundreds or even, well, dialects might be the thousands. And then of course, but um, who was it? I think it was, oh, who did say that? I have to find the person who said that, well, India, it's a, it's a country, but it, it's also a continent. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine that in Europe alone, or even in my tiny country alone, we already have three official languages. And I don't know how many dialects. Can you imagine for such a big continent as India? And um, it's fascinating because um, in a way, that also means that you don't have to really worry about having to cover all the dialects because they're basically different languages. Mm -hmm. And just like in Europe, where you have, you know, your Google Assistant for one language or for the other, that's more representative of the situation in India as well. Interesting, yeah, because I've I've always thought it even just fascinating in the in the U.S. Of course, how you have, you know, quote unquote. American English, but then you go down south and they have a different dialect. You go to the East Coast, there's a different dialect. The Midwest has a different dialect. And you just see that in, in most world languages. And that's just something that's that's always just fascinated me. And um, I, I think that's that's going to be a large hurdle that voice will probably have to overcome <laughs> at, <laughs> at some point. Absolutely. Actually, I, did, I'm, I, I feel very impolite if I can't remember someone's name. So I just looked him up really quickly. It's, of course, Sri, um, Sri Raman Tiagarajan, who gave the presentation at Voice Lunch. And I, I could see his face, but I'm not really good at names. So my apology. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Ram, actually. <laughs> yeah. But he had such an insightful presentation about languages in India, which for me as a linguist is, of course, fascinating. And yes, dialects and accents. Because yes, accents. Dialects, of course, are like words and phrases, but the accents, so the, the pronunciation, that's, I mean, that's just um, a different beast altogether. If we want to actually make voice inclusive, um, there's just such a long way still to go, considering that some voices are not, some languages are not even represented on smart speakers right now, right. let alone on the dialects and the accents. Right. And I know this is something that, that you and I talked about in that follow-up call we had, where the only way to really train the conversational AI to do that now, of course, is with available data sets. And unfortunately, we keep running into the problem of these available data sets being skewed and biased, which is a, a whole thing in itself that I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about here in a bit. But one thing I, I want to ask is how large of a role do you think linguistics should play in conversational AI and design overall? And do you think enough developers currently focus on the language aspect of what they are building? Oh, that's uh, that's a really interesting question because there's there's several sides to it from how I see it. Um, what I do see is that linguists can play an important role as gatekeepers for language. Mm -hmm. Like we, or well, not me personally, but linguists tend to kind of record and collect data about languages that are about to go extinct. Uh, likewise, they could also play a role in making sure that the language diversity that we have in our real world is properly reflected in the virtual world. So um, making sure that languages get represented, but also making sure that cultures are represented. Mm -hmm. Because for me, language is, is one of the key aspects of what makes your culture. Yes. And literally making your voice heard it's not just about speaking, it's also about being and well, being allowed to be. 
can my voice be heard is literally a question that's so relevant also for a smart speaker. And it's about gender, it's about race, it's about culture. So I think linguists can play a really important role in making voice technology really inclusive. Yes, I, I agree with you 100%. And that's been, you know, one of my kind of back of the brain concerns that I've been working in this more is the worst thing that can happen for this technology is it, it becomes siloed. And the moment yeah. that happens, I mean, just, I don't, I don't even want to imagine what that would be like. So I think it would probably bequeath the industry to really put more of an emphasis on, you know, an emphasis on linguists and the work that they do to your point of, you know, language being a cultural identifier. And if we don't have that, especially in a technology we're trying to make open and inclusive for all, then mm -hmm. I don't think we're ultimately going to get where all of us are hoping that the technology gets to, right? Um, sure. So yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. And do you think conversational AI can ever be evolved to meet the needs of different languages, dialects, accents, and um, I don't know if you agree that if, if that's the most challenging part about voice at the moment. Uh, well, that's a very personal question because well, people <laughs> that know me a bit longer than today know how I feel about Dutch not being represented on Alexa mm -hmm. and Bixby. <laughs> and to, to be honest, from a language perspective, any language can be made available um, through smart speakers and voice technology. Uh, so I think it's also very much a matter of uh, choice of perhaps commercial interest and that for me is a bit worrying because um, imagine you know smart speakers becoming more present in households uh, and imagine my my example is always you know the smart speaker next to your your baby's bed yep. and um, uh, what happens if your baby hears Alexa all the time uh, but also for me as a non native English speaker, uh, what happens if children in the Netherlands are continuously exposed to English voices? Uh, I'm not too worried about it because we get a lot of, lot of English television and films and we, we are exposed to English all the time, but um, we always have a choice and there's, there's a bit of, you know, um, still a barrier because you have to switch on the television, you have to right. go to the cinema. But voice technology has the potential to become so omnipresent that then, yes, it's definitely, for me at least, very important that we're all represented. Yeah, and, and that's something that I've been reading about a lot more, I feel like, as articles come up to your point about the smart speaker being next to the baby's crib and mm -hmm. how that interaction from the onset of birth almost is going to change the psychological structure of of the person i mean really i mean that and there's studies that are now starting to come out where that is happening though right where children who are exposed to these pieces of technology the actual structure of their brain is changing as as they've gotten older which i, I mm -hmm. think is absolutely fascinating but also something that needs to be taken into strong consideration because to your point you know and i talked about this um with uh, Noel Silver back in February of last year, and we met up at a conference. But you know, if if a child is accustomed to using a female wake word for a device from the onset of birth, what is their perception of females going to be as they get older, given this female wake word for this device, and they're associating that with this omnipresent entity that does their bidding? How are they going to view women and, and females as they get older? Exactly. And well, there's, again, uh, several aspects to that. As a linguist, I'm, I'm fascinated by language change. Also, I'm not really worried about it because humans always evolve to communicate in the way that's most efficient for them. Um, so that inevitably means that language is going to change. Of yeah. course, what's happening now is that, first of all, we're training the voice systems. But what if it turns around and they start training us? Because, you know, <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? When you put a smart speaker next to a baby, you're basically kind of training your baby because right. children learn language by exposure. Mm -hmm. And what happens if that language is biased? What happens if the data set of your smart speaker or your voice action is trained on a data set that's, that's like you say, not completely neutral in how it sees women or minorities or... You know, um, so that's that's uh, one aspect. And the other aspect is that there is something that we can do. And that's where conversation designers come in. 
because no one tells us that we have to design a personality for a female voice that right. has to be submissive or subservient. We can make those voice assistants actually really strong and powerful personalities. I mean, I grew up with Knight Rider. I wanted to have a watch where I could talk to kids. So, <laughs> I mean, why don't we make more like more Knight Rider kind of action? Right. You know? That would be wonderful. And um, ultimately, the, the, we're the people that decide what the voice is going to be. So if yes. we decide it's going to be a male voice or even a gender neutral voice, it's completely up to us. And for, for that, I think a lot more awareness is necessary. And that's yes. definitely something that the conversation design community can do. Yes. It's also something that we in Women in Voice, I'm the chapter lead for the Dutch chapter, is something that we take really seriously and mm -hmm. talk a lot about. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. And, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people have been talking about uh, one of the Voice Global presentations this week from Brett Cancelo, where he talks about this, you know, over the course of the next couple of years, completely breaking free of these siloed ecosystems where it's a multi-platform environment and enterprise companies are going to begin creating, you know, their own voice assistants versus using something like, you know, Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant or Bixby, which I view as a completely good thing and something I want to happen because then it all isn't controlled by just a handful of people, which is what it truly has been if you think about it since 2014, I mean, yeah, we can look at, you know, Siri being there in 2011 and just speech technology that Nuance has developed over the last couple of decades. But really in the consumer marketplace, 2014, it's been held by these three companies. So I, I think the time has come for us to really look at other avenues of developing voice. And I think when that shift happens, conversational designers are going to be more crucial than ever. Um, absolutely, 100%. Yeah. So with that in mind, do you ever think we will reach a point where conversational AI or voice will sound exactly like another human being? Technologically, yes, absolutely. Um, ethically, I'm not so sure about that. Yeah. I mean, and that's a matter of choice. But technically, <laughs> it's funny because I say yes. And I said yes 20 years ago when I was actually gluing pieces of sound together in my language lab when I was still studying. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's how, that's actually how speech technology evolved. We recorded speech and then we just chopped it up with a really kind of, you know, basic computer. I think it, we work with Apple Macintosh classic kind of, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and that was really advanced. Um, but <laughs> the interesting and perhaps a bit disturbing fact is that the software programs that I used back then are still in use right now. Oh my gosh. You know, um, I, so, I can't say I'm shocked. I can't. <laughs> it's, um, it, it, um, there's a lot of, a lot of technological uh, advancement happening right now. And I think that technological speaking, yes, we are going to be able to have voices that sound just like humans. I think there might even be some already. Um, it will be interesting though, because voice quality of course is one thing, but what really makes a synthetic voice or a voice experience different from human speech to me right now is timing and rhythm. Mm -hmm. When I talk to you, we have a kind of a rhythm, a kind of a cadence, we call it in Dutch, a cadence, I don't know. Anyway, yep. a kind of a beat. We have got like, is that tick, tick, tick. And you know when it's your turn, I know when it's my turn, and we act we react instantaneously. We, we kind of, you know, we sense each other mm -hmm. in that sense. And that's basically done in terms of rhythm, in terms of really turn taking. And that is something that for me is completely lacking when I talk to a smart speaker. The mm -hmm. fact that I have to wait really long to get a response immediately gives away that this is never going to be a human yeah. like experience. However, I do see some technologies rising right now where there's almost instantaneous entity and intent recognition where you can actually correct yourself while speaking and mm -hmm. the software will follow. And that will be really interesting because that's like, like the, the, the keynote in uh, Voice Global by Google um, where you can kind of speak to your app and have like this instant reaction. And that's really fascinating. If we can make the speed Yes, I, I agree with you. I think when that happens, this is when this is really going to accelerate. And we're we're working on an Alexa skill for, um, well, we're going to bring it to Google as well, but we're working on a, a voice app specific to the new 
e-commerce less voice commerce company that we're getting up and running. And it's difficult. It's difficult to try and get the technology right now to engage in conversation like another human being. I've been working with my CTO and he's like, well, why don't you just give them the options of what to say? I'm like, because Brett, I go, when you're talking to another person, they don't give you options on what to ask them. I go, we need to break <laughs> free of that mindset. I go, I want it to be like a conversation where it's just implied. You know what to ask and you know what to say. And I'm, I'm really stingy on that because that's how I see this technology evolving. Yeah. So. Same, same here. It's um, um, another thing that, of course, um, voice experience cannot do yet is the umming and the you knowing. Mm, yes. Also, the use of silence as a meaningful thing rather than, hmm, is it working or not? If you know that your system is always working and if the rhythm is right, the silence can be just as meaningful as an utterance. Yes. Um, and it's really interesting because I had this um, this. Uh, discussion on Voice Global with Kathy and Alan, who had the same question. Alan from Voice Lunch. He's like, well, everybody knows Alan from Voice Lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we were both kind of bothered by the fact that um, uh, on Google Assistant, you always need to finish your turn with a prompt for the user. Whereas in natural speech, when you stay silent for a significant time, the other knows, oh, it's my turn. Yeah. Um, and this would be so nice to to be able to do with your voice assistant as well. But then again, and Kathy was completely right about that. She's like, well, yeah, people don't know what to say when your assistant doesn't say that doesn't ask you anything. So there's still a bit of work for conversation designers, I think, like, okay, how do we handle these prompts to make them less less invasive, less kind of stringent? Yes, I I, I think truly when when it can have some of those different, you know, ums and mm hmms and different just natural utterances that we make is when truly I think we'll, we'll break this barrier that I think almost all of us have where it's just like it's still almost just like a chat bot in a, in a piece of hardware. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really though, I mean, yeah. you know, and that's kind of where, you know, the path model was where you're leading somebody down a path and yeah, yeah, yeah. I get you're trying, you know, we're trying to get people to an end result in the experience we're creating, but it's meant to be conversational. There is no path in conversation. Conversation is random. It is unique. It is um, different in every interaction. And I, I just want that to happen so bad. And I, I can't wait for it to. And I, I truly encourage all the conversation designers listening, including you, Micah, to, to do anything in your power to, to get this to happen quicker because it's, it's absolutely needed. Yeah, so, and yeah sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, you go ahead. I, you were going to probably hop into another good point. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to switch flows again. <laughs> That's why I love chatbots and voice so much because my head, well, everybody's head works just the same. It's really associative. But you saying that everything should be conversational triggered another question in my mind and that does it really because there's of course many use cases that are very kind of more um action based like okay switch on the lights and stuff like that mm. and uh, ahmed Buzi from whitlingo he said he had a really interesting um uh, post on that as well and um it's funny because people don't have any problem with the basic skills on Alexa or the basic actions on Google, which are very action oriented and mm -hmm. very simple in a way. So it's interesting to, to see, okay, aren't we perhaps stretching the metaphor too far sometimes? Should we really have this conversational experience with basically a black box that asks me to close my eyes, tie my hands behind my back and only use my voice? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. And for me, I mean, I, I think we're definitely on the same line here because you are a sci-fi fan as much as I am. Yes. But also fairy tales, what can you talk to? It's the magic objects, it's the right. trees, it's the mirrors, it's the robots. So for me, voice interfaces will be very much about what surface are they attached to? What object in my environment are they attached to? Um, how can I approach my outside world through a voice interface rather than having to face a little black box that yeah. you know doesn't allow me to use all my other senses. Yes, and I, I think that's exactly where we are too. We're in the black box phase where it's there, but we don't know anything we don't know anything outside of the cylinder or the case or whatever it's housed in. 
And I think that that definitely is a, is a holdback for a lot of people. I, I read that post you did too. And I, I truly am also a, of the mind where we are going to have this stuff in the walls and we're going to be able to walk into any room, any building, you know, and just interact with computers. I mean, talk about a life, right? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, and again, it needs to be done right if it happens, but I mean, that I think is, that is the long-term evolution of all of this is it's going to be like what we've seen in in movies and sci-fi for so many years where computer quote unquote is just sitting in the walls and will assist us and interact with us and, yeah. and do different things. Yeah. And where we can whatever, evoke all of our senses. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one really nice example of a use case that does that already to me. I don't know if I'm allowed to name companies here, but I'll do it anyway, because I just love the use case of incredible unboxing so much because what they actually, Oh yeah. What Stuart is, Crane did. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they actually make use of the smart speaker in its, well, natural environment. Many people have a smart speaker in their kitchen. Kitchen is also where you unpack all the boxes and all your mm-hmm. meal to get rid of it. So when you open the box, you're in the kitchen already. And then you've got the use case of, hey, I'm in the kitchen. My smart speaker is in the kitchen. Hey, why don't I ask my smart speaker about this box? What's in it? What I can do with it? For me, that is within perhaps the limitations of our current voice technology, such a wonderful use of voice technology also in the right environment. Yes. It's very situational and it's useful because I mean, I've ordered my fair share of subscription boxes and, you know, I get all the products in it. There's always all this paper and everything. How easy would it be? Like, you know, when I, when I talk with Stuart about it, I mean, it's just so simple to be able to be like, you know, Alexa, Google, you know, tell me more about, you know, clothes a box or you know food b box or um you know something like that so i agree with you i think what they've done is an is an excellent use case for sure so switching our conversation a bit now to maybe more on the the ai side of things you and i i know in our follow-up talk talked a lot about ethics and ethical considerations not only for conversational ai but just ai in general so what are some of the top ethical considerations that you think need to be considered as well, conversational AI and AI in general mature and become more ubiquitous in our everyday lives. Oh, that's that's opening a. <laughs> no, I know it is. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a minute? <laughs> well, obviously, the first one is who are the people who are going to build our experiences? Are mm-hmm. our teams diverse enough in terms of gender, in terms of race, but also in terms of age, for instance? because um, 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 needs and requirements for younger people differ substantially from older people. So in order to do that, we need a lot of diversity in our teams because it's the teams that select the data that we are going to use for our, for our AI. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing is, okay, do we really can we really rely on unsupervised learning for this kind of experiences? Um, I, I'm, I'm not an, an AI expert, so I don't know of any other ways, but uh, as a linguist, I do see that the statistical method of training your NLP um, does not necessarily give the best results in intent matching, mm-hmm. but also it has this inherent risk of introducing bias into your data set. Um, so perhaps, and I don't I really don't know about this. I'm not very yeah. knowledgeable in the field, but perhaps there are other ways of still getting the richness of culture and language and gender and race and age um, by perhaps curating data sets or making um, transparent what's in there and how and why. Um, ethical AI for me is very much about um, explainable AI. So being able to trace back how data came Mm -hmm. uh, came about. Um, And the only way to do that, I think, is to create awareness in the teams and to make sure that the teams are diverse enough to break their own bubbles. Right. Well, and that's something I've been thinking about a lot, too. You know, right now we're the ones having to, of course, train and create these different AI models. And, of course, we're providing the data set. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, I think every everybody in 
I don't want to generalize, but what, what I'm trying to say is a lot of the people who create these AI models and data sets now, you know, probably have some type of inherent bias. And I'm not assuming, I'm just saying like, I think, you know, everybody has just, we don't even recognize some of these inherent biases, right? But when you're in, when you're in the deep of programming something or designing something, it just may manifest itself without even realizing it. But when it does that, it gets into the data set. And that's what I've been thinking more and more about is how do we overcome that inherent bias, you know, specifically for people who are creating these different models, you know, to, to be aware and cognizant that maybe the bias is present without them even knowing about it. That's a tall order to fill, but I don't know if that's something that you've thought about as well. Yeah, it's, it's quite a contradiction as well, because in order to break bias, you need input from many sides. Right. But when you get input from many sides, you again run the risk of creating the bias if... <laughs> You know, if right. yeah, large numbers of people, yes, but make sure that they're diverse enough. So perhaps the solution can be really simple. Just create an overview of other sources of big data that might perhaps have another bias. And I don't know if it's technically, technically possible to kind of, you know, uh, match them and kind of even them. I'm <laughs> yeah. But that's really kind of taking things into sci-fi, I guess. But um, the, the thing is that Every time you hear about conversational experiences that are trained on big data, they tend to go rogue pretty fast. Very quickly. <laughs> on the other hand, it's interesting because I, I, I did a little research into Facebook Blender myself. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that it was inherently biased. It was just that the chatbot itself didn't have enough of a backbone to actually stick to one position. Mm -hmm. So whenever I, I talk to Blender from different points of view, I started out as a, a, a you know, like a feminist activist and it completely agreed with me. It was like, yeah, really important. Women and men are equal and blah, 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 blah. Great, wonderful. And then within 20 turns, I actually managed to, to turn it into something really misogynistic, like a, a woman hater, just because I fed it other data. Interesting. So I was like, Interesting, yes, the, the first answer will be perhaps biased by the data set, but as soon as I as a person start switching my perspective, Blender just happily went along. And that's much more interesting, like, okay, yeah. how much of a own character and own set of moral values should a chatbot have? And that's, of course, where Asimov comes in. <laughs> oh my gosh, and well, and that, you know, that raises the whole, you know, how do we create intelligence? You know, how do we how do we transcend consciousness into technology? And you're right. That's where the real sci-fi yeah. stuff comes in because then that brings in the whole aspect of human personality and cognition. And yeah, because you know that Facebook actually put a filter on Blender to make sure that this kind of language and behavior was kind of ruled out. But it's an external filter, so you can remove it, which is mm -hmm. what happened in the demo where I used it. But what if we could actually create chatbots that just like robots have like, um, oh, I don't know how Asimov called it again, but they've got the moral values kind of, you know, burned into their physical kind of wiring or their yeah. software or something. So, yeah, that's a really interesting thought experiment to think, can we do that with our AI? But then yeah, again, no, what are those values? <laughs> no, exactly. What are those values? I, I think, you know, it always seems like, how I view it is humans are builders and creators. And, you know, even if we know maybe we shouldn't be making something <laughs> at the atom bomb, we're going mm -hmm. to make it anyhow, just because we can't help ourselves. So <laughs> I just hope with something like this, which is going to be, I think, I, I mean, just transformational more so than anything else we've created. We cannot have the old ways happen again where we don't care about the future ramifications while we're building it and then have to tackle them down the line like mm -hmm. that is a pattern that needs to end that humanity is historically known for right <laughs> <laughs> well have you ever tried changing your habits oh yeah it's hard it's insanely <laughs> hard it's it's absolutely hard and yeah. you know especially when you're looking you know that's just me when you apply it to the scope of our entire species. I mean, that's the tallest order imaginable, but you know, I think about it and I'm like, if, if we, if, even if we did a little bit at the front end, it's going to make a heck of a lot more difference when AI finally becomes completely ubiquitous because we, you know, we, there'll, there'll just be a lot more 
a lot fewer concerns, I think. You know, we kind of saw that happen with with Facebook. Like, you know, we 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 got the social media platform that just totally changed the game, connected all of us, and we all just put all of our information out there and everything. And then, you know, none of the I mean, maybe the considerations were made in some circles, but I don't think widely that, oh, this can actually be used to manipulate, you know, opinion and the data can be used against us. And then when that happened, everybody was like, uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, it's uh, when I think of it and sometimes when I think of it too much and it gets overwhelming, I, I think of one thing nowadays. After I saw Brian, our candidate commercial astronaut mm -hmm. that appeared on, on Voice Lunch, there's one thing that can actually kind of um, quiet me down again. It's the thought like, whatever we do, we should always build a mechanical switch. So that oh, we can just switch the point. entire thing off again. <laughs> yes. Oh, Micah, that's brilliant. Because he was so adamant on, we still have a mechanical switch that can turn this off or turn this on or, huh. For me, it's a very reassuring thought. As long as we build a mechanical switch somewhere, I can sleep. Yeah, that's really <laughs> good. Oh, you need, to, you need to quote that and frame it and then trademark that. Oh, perhaps I should make a little drawing out of it. <laughs> um, so one of the last things I want to quickly touch on here is, you know, there's all this talk about, you know, what what is voice in comparison to the internet? You know, it's, you know, it functions using cloud computing, which is internet based and all this different stuff. But, you know, should we be actively comparing voice to something like the internet? Or do you think we should be taking more of a, um, and I saw you talk about this, more of a quote unquote model modal approach. And, and maybe if you can explain that a bit, your thoughts on that. Sure, sure, sure. Um, well, for me, the, the internet, um, I, I was actually there at the kind of the rise of the internet. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm that old. Um, the internet started out for me, at least as a collection of interlinked content, you know, hypercard, stuff like that. So it was very much about content, which later on became much more interactive with, with ASP, I think, and stuff like that. So we started adding video and audio, but still um, the metaphor that's there is still very much of a library, something you go into and mm -hmm. then find what you need. Whereas voice for me is much more the, the locus of voice. So the, the point of interaction is much more in the world outside. I would really be happy to live in a world, like I said already, where I can interact with my environment through mm -hmm. a voice interface when I don't want to use my hands, um, where I can, I don't have to go into something to find what I'm looking for, but I can just ask somewhere, you know, and get an answer like that. Um, so voices, internet, I think it's a stage uh, on the way to much, a more disruptive metaphors, I think. Um, and it's going to be interesting where we are going with that because voice as internet is perfectly feasible and it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a good use case for companies, for commerce, but the real potential of voice for me is much more in futuristic sci-fi kind of, oh, okay, yeah. to get me a coffee and yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with you. I think in, in the current stage, I can see the relevancy of comparing it to the internet, but I think there is going to be a point where it transcends beyond that. And I think we're going to definitely have to shift our thinking as a collective group of, we maybe shouldn't be comparing this to things of the past or something like the internet because it's an entirely new technology. You know, yeah, it, it, it obtains data from, you know, quote unquote, the internet, but at the end of the day, the way the technology works and understands information is just entirely different. And, and it's not necessarily visual, right? Where the internet, I mean, yeah, it, it, it sends data to and fro, but it's also mainly visual, you know, if you want to access it. Um, and I, I just think that's where the, the complete differences between that and voice. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see, I think, how the perspective on that changes and really how the technology moves beyond this notion we have of, of it being something similar to the internet. I think we've got a pretty clear timeline on that because if we really want to see voice as internet, we're going to run out of unique voice identifiers really, really soon. Because mm -hmm. have you ever tried adding a um, domain extension to a voice invocation? Yeah, it's... No. No. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, our, our choice of invocations for voice assistants is pretty limited if you want to roll out, roll it out like worldwide. <laughs> yeah. 
and so that's that's going to be really interesting to see okay how are we going to solve that and in the meantime that's just i mean there yes there are some analogies that you can make in my opinion internet is interlinked content i think voice is much more about interlinked objects and interlinked actionable mm. items uh, and that's what we do as people when we talk to each other we're always talking to each other because we want to achieve a goal either have an action done a problem solved mm -hmm. uh, need fulfilled like an emotional need for companionship we never talk out of the ordinary and that's perhaps also or out of the blue and perhaps that's also why why talking to a smart speaker is sometimes a bit awkward because it's almost like the friend that never calls you back like you always have to initiate this <laughs> yeah. conversation yourself and it's yeah it's yeah it would be nice if if your smart speaker would just start talking to you for a change like hey right. how are you doing <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that would change a lot. And I, I really like um, what you just explained there about how every time we talk with somebody else, it's goal oriented and it's object based. I think that's that's going to be something I think I sit on for a bit after hearing you say that, because that that to me, that that could be a, a really interesting shift in thinking on just developing um, for this technology moving forward. And And kind of back to my point earlier about really trying to do everything in our power when we develop, you know, quote unquote, voice apps or different things to make them conversational, not make them boxed in. Um, and, you know, if the user's using it, they have a goal in mind, <laughs> just like how, how we talk with other people. Um, so no, I, that's, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's definitely going to make me think about some things, but Micah, this has been such an amazing, cool, all around excellent conversation. I, I've enjoyed it so much. And to kind of wrap things up here, what is one thing that you think someone can do today to begin leveraging AI or voice assistant tech, either personally or within their organization? Mm. Start the conversation, the human to human conversation, and start looking for the business case that actually needs voice as a solution to a problem. So not just as a gimmick, because, but as something that can really add value. Yep, absolutely. And I think, you know, what I found, I don't know if you found this in some conversations with people who, of course, are outside of the voice community, but I, I think they still see it often as a gimmick, which it's, it's hard to break through that barrier because you're like, but no, this is transformational technology and like all this stuff. And I found that the moment, you know, you can kind of paint that picture, that roadmap with folks who are, are not necessarily working in voice and who work for enterprise and medium and small businesses. And you can start seeing the gears turning once you paint that, that picture and you say like, oh, do you, you know, it's something simple like, do you have a call center? Great. Well, imagine being able to offload some of that maybe to a voice assistant, you know, kind of likewise, you know, ha having a chat bot to supplement some of that and different things is when I think they can start seeing the value there a bit more so i think that's a, a very good piece of advice and one 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 closing note i think especially in times like these inclusivity design yes. for everyone means listen to everyone understand everyone reach out to everyone and if you do that in real life that will definitely also have your effects on your 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 voice technology yes that's excellent closing point thank you well Micah, again, it's been an amazing time getting to chat with you. If anybody wants to contact you or reach out to you, what are some of the best ways for them to do so? Um, I guess that well, I'm most active on LinkedIn and Twitter. And, um, well, my name is a bit hard to find, I guess, but ConvoCut will get you there. And otherwise, they'll probably reach out to you and you'll put me through, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll, I'll make sure to include any links in the episode notes. Um, so oh, and of course, I'm in every international voice launch. Yes, definitely. Always yes. There. Micah is always there, no matter what it seems like. So if, if you're working in the voice space, or even if you're somebody outside just looking to connect with people and, and learn more about the technology, I mean, voice lunch is an excellent thing. It's every, every Tuesday and Thursday, the times vary depending on your time zone, but you don't have to also look far to find that information. So, but Micah, again, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me on, on this week's episode. I really appreciate it and can't wait to have more fun discussions in the future. Cool. My pleasure for being here. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Artificial intelligence. Voice recognition. Machine learning. Robot. You've been listening to the Artificial Podcast with your host, Nick Myers. Nick Myers. To stay up to date with all our latest episodes, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. 
To learn more about how your organization can benefit by unlocking the power of AI and voice, visit www.redfox-ai.com. Until next time.